good morning. It is your boy Jay Goble back at it again for Not Many Noble. Reading the Bible through in 22 with you. It is December 11th. That means we've been reading the Bible together 345 days. 345 days. And we have 20 days left this year. 20 days. That's it. It is Worldwide Candle Lighting Day, National Have a Bagel Day, International Mountain Day, World Coral Day, and National Noodle Ring Day. How about that? How about that? That's what we've got going on the rest of the world. <laughs> what are we doing? Well, we're reading the Bible through in chronological order from beginning to end, starting in Genesis, ending in Revelation, and we're putting things where we think they belong, or at least the reading list that I have. We are... We've completed Acts. Paul was in prison in Rome. Paul the Apostle was in prison in Rome, and he wrote letters. Of those letters, we have the letter to the Philippians. We started it last yesterday, last day, yesterday, and today we're going to read Philippians 2.12 through 4.23. This is out of the World English Bible Translation. So then, what do you mean, so then? Well, here. God exalted, so Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being found in human form, humbled himself, obedient to the point of death, death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him highly, gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, even as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That, that, it sounds almost contradictory, doesn't it? A little bit. I think we can be honest, but the way it's a little mysterious, the way that our will and the will of God work together, they're friends, not enemies. They're like smoke from two candles kind of going up together. They mix together. They work together, but where exactly I think you, do you draw the line? I don't think you can tell that. I don't think that's discernible until maybe after looking back. This obedience. You're obviously exercising your will. You have a will. You're exercising it. And now he's saying, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear. This right view of who God is, who, who man is, and the nature of the relationship between the two of us. Trembling at the the magnitude of what we're talking about salvation a soul being saved from damnation right for <laughs> for what's really going on he's giving you a glimpse behind the curtain here for what's really going on is this god is doing the work for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Your salvation, your sanctification, your growth in holiness is God's good pleasure. Do we think of it that way? I'm afraid we don't. We, we Rightfully so. We look at these things like spiritual disciplines to be cultivated. Reading, praying, silence and solitude, fasting public worship, private worship, family worship, almsgiving and, and generosity, hospitality, all these different things that we consider kind of like spiritual disciplines, right? And we think of them as like, I got to do this. I got to get it done. I got to get it done. I got to become the best version of myself. It is God's good pleasure to work in you to accomplish those things. It is his pleasure, not drudgery, pleasure. It is his pleasure. It's right. He's flipping the script. Now, this makes a little more sense when he goes on to the next verse here. If you flip it, 
if you flip it like, oh, this is God's good pleasure. Now, he says, do all things without complaining and arguing. Why would you complain and argue about God's good pleasure? Doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to complain and argue about that. It's enjoyable. It gives me what I need. It gives me, it gives my brain what it needs. <laughs> that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without defect, in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you are seen as lights in the world, holding up the word of life, that I may have something to boast in the days of Christ, in the day of Christ, that I didn't run in vain, nor labor in vain. So he's worried. He's saying, hey, I want to be able to look back. I want to be able to say that my sacrifice here was not, was worthwhile, was not in vain. That you, the first fruits, or maybe not the first fruits, but you, the, the fruit of my labor in preaching the gospel, have stood the test of time. He continues, yes, and if I am poured out on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and rejoice with you all. In the same way, you also rejoice and rejoice with me. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered up when I know how you're doing. For I have no one else like-minded who will truly care about you. For they all seek their own good, not the things of Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him, that as a child serves a father, so he served with me in furtherance of the good news. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself will also come shortly. But I counted it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, and your apostle and servant of my need, since he longed for you all and was very troubled because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, nearly to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, that I might not have sorrow on sorrow. I have sent him therefore the more diligently, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and that I may be with that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all joy, and hold such people in honor, because for the work of Christ he came near to death, risking his life to supply that which was lacking in your service toward me. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, is not tiresome, but for you, it is safe. And sometimes we don't like hearing the same thing. It's not exciting. It's not new. It's not invigorating. I don't want to master the basics. I don't want to just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. But we must be reminded of the same things over and over. That's kind of life. That's the way the world is, I would argue. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If any other man thinks that he has confidence in the flesh, I yet more. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the assembly, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. However, I consider those things that were gained to me as a loss for Christ. So it's like, why, if, if I have already crossed these T's better and dotted these I's better, why would you listen to these other dudes coming in trying to convince you of it? That, that that's what you need to do. When I'm telling you that you don't need to, that is not that is not salvation. It is not doing these things. Yes, most certainly I count all things to be a loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things and count them nothing but refuse, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained or am already made perfect, but I press on, that I may take hold of that for which also I was taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, 
I don't regard myself as yet having taken hold, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and stretching forward to the things which are before. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, think this way. If in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you. Nevertheless, to the extent that we have already attained, let's walk by the same rule. Let's be of the same mind. Brothers, be imitators together of me, and note those who walk this way, even as you have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I told you often, and now tell you even weeping, as the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is the belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who think about earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from where we also wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change the body of our humiliation to be conformed to the body of his glory, according to the working by which he is able even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, beloved and longed for, my joy and crown stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I exhort Eudia and I exhort Syntyche to think the same way in the Lord. Yes, I beg you also, true partner, help these women, for they labored with me in the good news with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. It's like this dude's in prison over here exhorting people who are arguing. And people were thinking, my, I should, maybe I should be circumcised and maybe I need to keep the law and maybe I need to become a Jew. That's the things they're arguing about. And he's over here saying, they're probably stressed, right? You've been through these things at church. These, some of the dramas, the micro dramas, the macro dramas, the problems, they stress you out sometimes. And he's saying, you got it all twisted. You ain't looking at the world right. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. In nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. That I think those those two verses we never did we never did get to memorizing. My bad. Maybe we'll do that next year. But this is definitely a text. This is definitely a text that needs to be memorized. In nothing, be anxious in nothing. In nothing be anxious. Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are honorable, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is any praise, think about these things. Just six, seven, and eight. The things which you learned, received, heard, and saw in me, do these things and the God of peace will be with you. That is a powerful leadership right there. Do as I do. We're on the same journey. And then he, he in other places, he says, you know, follow me only as I follow Christ. I think we already read that. Like, do as I do, but only as it uh, is correct. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. I'm going on the same journey with you. I'm driving down the same road with you. But, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your thought for me, in which you did indeed take thought, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak because of lack, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content in it. I know how to be humbled, and I know how to abound. In everything and in all things I have learned the secret both to be filled and to be hungry, both to abound and to be in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. However, you did well that you shared in my affliction. You yourselves also know, you Philippians, that in the beginning of the good news, when I departed from Macedonia, no assembly shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again to my need. Not that I seek for the gift, but I seek for the fruit that increases to your account. But I have all things and abound. I am filled, having received from Epaphroditus the things that came from you, a sweet-smelling fragrance, an acceptable and well-pleasing sacrifice to God. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.
This, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that is Philippians 4.13. That, of course, is one of our famous texts to be taken out of context, right? And put anywhere. Now, I mean, it pretty much means anything. Any opposition, any anything that comes and stands in my way, uh, any goal, no matter how worldly, fleshly, or self-serving it is, I can attach this verse to it. And boom, there I go. I've taken not only the moral high ground, but I bring with me the force of scripture. So, yay. But that's not where Paul's at, right? He's not trying to say that I'm going to do everything. I got it all. I can do whatever I want to do. Peace out, y'all. He is in prison. And he's saying that while in prison for the gospel, here's the, this is what I've learned as a missionary going out and giving my life up, selling it off, saying no to self, nothing at all. In that state, I have learned to be content. I got what I need. I know how to be humbled. I know how to abound in everything and in all things. The secret both to being filled and to being hungry to abound and to be in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's where he's at. That's where he's at. That's where we should be as well. Instead of overly over spiritualizing our own fleshly desires. <laughs> we do that though, don't we? We do that. I want this. Now let me wrap a text around it. Let's pray. Father, have mercy on us, we pray. Give us grace to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Give us grace to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And give us grace to not wrap texts around our earthly desires, our sinful desires. Give us grace to put to death the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And to instead seek to be poured out before you, a drink offering before our Lord, to serve you, to, to, to thrive where you put us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all. Show notes are at notmanynoble.com. You can always get a hold of me, notmanynoble at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. I will catch you tomorrow. Peace. Peace.